Okay, so today I'll be talking about the neural innovation of the facet joint, sacroiliac joints, the ganglion impart, and the nerve root orientation in the uh, neural foramina. So where there's a joint, there's movement. Where there's movement, there's degeneration, and where there's degeneration, there's pain. And the facet joint and low back pain have been associated with each other very closely. Uh, it's been estimated that the facet joint pathology is contributory in 15 to 50 percent of patients with chronic low back pain. So it does play a big role. But exclusive facet joint pain ca uh, causing the low back pain is as low as 4 percent. And the rates of facet arthrosis in the general population is around 57 percent between 20 and 29 years of age, above 90 percent between 40 and 49, and around 100 percent by the time someone's 60, and most of which. Uh, happens at L45. So it's a very common condition. And why is it painful? It's painful because the capsule and the synovial folds inside the joint both possess nociceptive nerve endings. So uh, the substance P nerve fibers that have been identified in the subchondral bone in the degenerative lumbar facet joint also. And inflammatory mediators such as prostaglandins and cytokines have been found in these cases. So if you look at the innovation of the facet joint. Uh, so there's a spinal cord, the thecal sac, the nerve root comes out, it gives a ventral branch and gives a dorsal branch out. So if you look at the first image, the dorsal branch will then go on to give three branches, a lateral intermediate and a medial branch. So the medial branch will hug the facet joint. And then it supplies the facet joint. And then it continues to sub go on and supply the multifidus. So uh, that's looking at it from an axial view. If you look at it from a, a sagittal view, you would see the neural foramina, the nerve root coming out from the foramina, and then it goes on to give a ventral branch and a dorsal branch, and the dorsal branch would give a medial branch. So looking at just uh, the medial branch, so once the, once the medial branch has come out from the dorsal branch, uh, there's a medial, intermediate, and lateral branch, all of these supplying the muscles at the back and the joint, facet joint. The medial branch, it comes out and supplies the facet joint, but it also receives a branch from the medial branch of the joint superior. So both of these together combine and supply the facet joint. Next, coming to the uh, sacroiliac joint. So a few interesting parts about the sacroiliac joint. It's, the uni uh, it's unique in the sense that its articular surface has multiple ridges and depressions that develop and deepen over one's lifetime. During the natural maturation process, the morphology and characteristics of the SI joint will change. And the joint surface is relatively flat in earlier life, allowing for a good amount of movement in all directions. But however, as life progresses in the second and third decade, the joint surface will now develop distinct angulations and that flat smoothness it's going to lose. This in turn will help the two bones lock in with each other and give functional stability. So if you look at the sacroiliac joint, if you look at the whole sacrum, you'll see the sacroiliac joint will be covering just the upper half of the whole sacrum. And the upper half of the sacrum will correspond to the L5, S1, and S2 foramina. So then you would logically come to the conclusion that the nerve supply of the sacroiliac joint would be from the dorsal rami of the L5 to S2 nerve roots. But the nerve supply, it's a, it's a very highly innovated uh, joint. So from the back, it gets its nerve supply from L5, S1, and S2 from the dorsal rami of these uh, nerve roots. Sometimes it can, S3 can also contribute, but never does S4 come. And sometimes you have L4 also sending down a branch. But the nerves are there also anterior to it, and they will also participate in supplying the SI joint. So the ventral rami of L4, you are seen as a dot here. The ventral rami of L4, L5, and the superior gluteal nerve, these will give branches into the sacroiliac joint from the front. The ganglion impar, it's an irregular shaped terminal ganglion that's uh, formed by the combination of the two sympathetic chains. And it's usually located in the midline. So it's variable shaped. You can be almost four millimeters to five millimeters long. And it's found on the anterior surface of the or sacrococcygeal joint. So here you see that the in the image that the sympathetic trunk is coming down on both the sides, and then they will combine here 
this is the sacrum coccyx so around that joint they generally combine and form the ganglion impart so why is the ganglion impart important it's important because it gives the sympathetic innervation to the perineum and relief of perineum pain by giving a ganglion impart block was uh, described first by plancarte in 1990 so uh, we usually use this for coccydynia now uh this is a case and on such i generally avoid this procedure but uh if a patient requires a surgery for any other reason and has this coccyx pain also you can go so there you see the needle going in through the coccyx uh, sac sacrococcygeal joint and a dye injection is going into uh, that area and you see the dye moving along the ganglion impart and then you get the anesthesia and coming to the final topic which is the nerve root orientation in the foramina so if you look uh, looking at the foramina we all know that the foramina has either a uh, inverted teardrop appearance or when you look at it on the parasagittal images of the mri scan it gives you a keyhole image so a keyhole which is wider and more round on the top and thinner down at the bottom so this is a uh, this is a, a foramina so the foramina if you uh, break the spine up into its different parts so you have a central part which is marked by one Two is the paracentral part. Three is the foraminal part, and four, the, four is the extra foraminal part. The third foraminal part is where the pedicle is, so it's above and below the pedicle. Now we all we all know that the foramina is primarily uh, occupied by the nerve root, but apart from the nerve root, there are many structures there, uh, all structures of importance. There's the nerve root, the sinovertebral nerves, uh, sympathetic fibers. intervertebral arteries and veins small lymphatics fatty areolar tissue and foraminal ligaments so a lot of structure there and uh, the nerve root is generally oriented in the superior part of the neural foramina as shown in this picture so here you see the keyhole appearance the disc in front ligamentum flavum at the back the joint here the superior articular and inferior articular process and you see the nerve root is located at the top of it and above it is the inferior notch of the superior pedicle below it is the superior notch of the inferior pedicle anterior to it is the vertebral body posterior to it is the joint and you know there's a disc just below it flavor at the back so it occupies around 35% of the foramen's diameter uh if you go higher in the lumbar spine it occupies lesser because the foramen is larger there if you go lower it occupies more so the foraminal height would generally vary between 20 and 23 mm the width is around 8 to 10 mm uh it's held sorry it's held the nerve root is held in this place by multiple ligaments there are around five ligaments in this area that go from the disc to the uh, superior part of the facet joint or uh, interligaments that connect the nerve root to the pedicle and it's basically creates a channel through which the nerve goes through and you have to understand that the a uh, neural foramina is a very variable changing uh, structure because when a patient moves flex extends uh, the foramina will change its height and diameter based on a person's disc height the foramina will change its diameter osteophytes there influence the foramina's diameter so it's very variable when a person will flex like in lumbar flexion uh, there's a 12% increase in the neural foraminal area and when a person extends there is around a 15% uh decrease in the foraminal area so that has been studied these are all studies published in spine so there are two types of foraminal stenosis that you get that influence the nerve root orientation in the foramina and i'd like to cover a little bit on both of them so one is a transverse stenosis so what is a transverse stenosis is basically when the disc height is maintained so the disc height is not the problem so that you can have a disc bulge there or a, a herniation there pushing the root pushing the on the root and causing uh, symptoms or at the back you can have a ligamentum flavor hypertrophy causing antero posterior stenosis in the foramina and that's one type of foraminal stenosis and the other type of foraminal stenosis is vertical stenosis so in this what happens is you the patient will lose disc height and this disc will then flatten out causing this superior articular process to push up into that foraminal canal and then result in a squeeze of the nerve root space so these are two uh, very clinically important points and with that i conclude my talk on the uh, nerve root orientation in the foramen and the innervations of these joints thank